Rosa, and I'm the director of the Humanities Institute, and it is really my pleasure to welcome you all to this Pressing Matters event today. And of course, to welcome Abigail Houston Box and Nick Mitchell, who will be our guests today. And you know, welcome to this virtual campus of Stony Brook University. Uh, I wish we could have you over in you know real in reality, but this is uh, also a pleasure. And uh, as director of the institute, I would like to introduce you to some of our activities. And I will share my screen just to show you what is coming this semester, some of the highlights of what's coming this semester. There are many other things. You only have to go to our calendar and you will find them there. And you will find also a way to link them to your own calendar so that you, you don't forget. And um, I am here. OK, great. So I'll introduce Liz Montegari. Sorry <laughs> that uh, I, th I thought you had to disappear of everybody's screen for a second panicking. <laughs> So Liz Montegari is uh, a great colleague of us, a member of the board of the Institute, and also uh, you know, a great intellectual presence on campus that we all look forward to hear from and to hear more of. So Liz is gonna give us the introduction to our speakers and thank you Liz for organizing a lot of this activity it wouldn't have been possible without you, of course. Uh, so thank you. And of course, thank you Adrian for coordinating and sorry for my missteps uh, as, <laughs> as I cannot really control the technology. So. <laughs> Okay, welcome, Nick, Liz, and the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Adrian, for that introduction, and thank you for your leadership here at the Humanities Institute, and especially for making the Pressing Matters series possible. Um, I also wanted to thank all the people who have been involved in organizing the Institute's Abolitionist Future series. My hope is that today's event is going to build on and lift up that critical work, and I really love that this event is happening in the wake of S.A. Smythe's fabulous talk last week. Uh, I'm also going to thank Adrian because I think, as most of us on this call know, she is the driving force behind this institute. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of you for, for coming out this afternoon, and a special thanks to the students of the Women's Gender and Sexual Studies graduate teaching practicum for embracing, albeit in a coerced way, the Pressing Matter opportunity. Um, the Pressing Matters series is designed to connect students with the scholars and organizers they're reading in their classes. So this semester I'm teaching a graduate course that is technically called Practicing Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, but it's more colloquially known as the WGSS teaching practicum. And while this course spends a lot of time thinking about queer and feminist pedagogical approaches and thinking about the practical work of designing syllabi and assignments and lesson plans, we also study the institutionalization of gender and sexuality studies. And we try to situate this rather recent past within the much longer history of higher ed in the United States. So we begin the semester by reading work that's helping us sharpen our analyses of the racial, the gender, and the colonial violences that are built into the fabric of the institution of the university. So it's in this context that we've read Abigail Boggs's and Nick Mitchell's collaborative work. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce them today. I have known both Abby and Nick since we were all grad students in the University of California system. Abby and I were in the cultural studies program at UC Davis. Uh, Nick was down the highway in the history of consciousness program at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm thrilled that they're here with us this afternoon, not only because it's fun to bring friends to work with you, but because I really do believe that they are doing some of the most compelling most unsettling and most generative work on the university today. I have learned a great deal from them over the years in our casual conversations, through our formal collaborations, and really from watching and frankly benefiting from how thoughtfully they bring people together and how effectively they build community. Uh, Abby Boggs is Assistant Professor of Sociology and Education Studies and Affiliated Faculty in Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies at Wesleyan University. She's currently completing her first book, American Futures, International Students in the U.S. University, which is under contract with Fordham University Press. This book provides a critical genealogy of the figure of the international student in university policy and federal immigration law and also in US popular culture. You can find her work in the usual places, Feminist Studies, American Quarterly, and The Scholar and the Feminist. And she's currently serving on the editorial board of the journal Abolition, a journal of insurgent politics. 
Nick Mitchell is Associate Professor of Feminist Studies and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies at UC Santa Cruz. His first book, Disciplinary Matters, Black Studies, Women's Studies, and the Neoliberal University, which is under contract with Duke University Press, emerges the historical emerge, excuse me, examines the historical emergence of these fields as knowledge formations in their own right, and as sites through which the university has managed the social upheavals consequent to the mass admission of Black, women and black women in particular students in the late 1960s. He's also finishing a second book entitled University in Theory, Essays on Institutional Knowledge. So stay tuned for their, their forthcoming work. And I'm gonna turn things over to Abby and Nick in a moment, but I just wanted to say a few words about the significance of their scholarly work and why I thought this constitute a pressing matter. Put simply, Abby and Nick take issue with the stories that the university tells about itself and the stories that are often told about the university. Traditional periodizations of the American university tend to turn on a kind of nostalgia for the post-World War II university. These golden age narratives, they argue, portray the university as thrown into crisis during the 1970s when suddenly outside forces compelled the institution to abandon its democratizing function and to start aligning its educational mission with technical expertise and economic efficiency. As Abby and Nick see it, such depictions obscure the university's foundational implication with racial capitalism and the carceral colonial state, while also glossing over the fact that the institution never actually delivered on its promises of justice. So in contrast, they propose an alternative and distinctly abolitionist conceptual framework for studying U.S. universities. As founding members of a collective of leftist scholars and organizers committed to building an abolition university, and more recently as coordinators of the National Cops Off Campus Research Project, they are uniquely positioned to offer advice on how we, and that we, I think, as students, its faculty, its staff, its other campus workers, what can we do to turn the university into an object of analysis, a site of intervention, and what I think might be the most important intervention is here, a resource to be exploited. And this is a pivotal moment for the university. The current economic and public health crisis is only further destabilizing higher ed in the US and beyond. And I think it's urgent that we as the Stony Brook community engage in this kind of self-reflexive analysis as we attempt to figure out an ethical path forward in the face of ever intensifying austerity and hear uh, ever louder calls for new methods of revenue generation. So I hope this is the uh, first of many similar conversations. Okay, I really am going to turn things over and stop talking, but I want to tell you about three other people who are crucial to this event. Um, here's how the event is going to work. Abby and Nick are going to offer an overview of their call for abolitionist university studies and about their collaborative process. And then we're going to shift into the public conversation portion of the event. And three students from the WGSS teaching practicum have prepared a few questions, and they're going to interview Abby and Nick before we open up to a more general Q&A. So first, uh, let me introduce Mara. Mario Anal. Mario, do you want to give a little wave so folks can see? Uh, Mario is a PhD student in Hispanic languages and literature. He's a professional in literary studies from the National University of Columbia, and he holds a master's degree in Argentine and Latin American film and theater studies from the University of Buenos Aires. His work can be found in Arcadia, the Argentine Film and Audiovisual Studies Association magazine, and also on different cultural blogs. Uh, Genevieve Ruzica, if you can give a little wave, I'd like to introduce Genevieve. She is a first year PhD student in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program. She actually received her BA in Africana Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies from Stony Brook. And she's now developing a research project based on her interests in critical race theory and pop culture studies with a particular emphasis on television studies. And finally, I'd like to introduce Jesenia Torres. Where are you? There you are. Jesenia is a first year MA student in women's gender and sexuality studies. She holds a BA in public relations and a minor in creative writing from SUNY Oswego. She's worked in the shelter system and is now conducting research on housing insecurity with a specific focus on POC and LGBTQ plus populations. Okay, this concludes the Liz Majigari portion of this event. I will now turn things over to Abby and Nick. Take it away, folks. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thanks to Adrian for all the work to make this happen. Thanks to Adrian for telling us more about what's going on at the Humanities uh, the Institute, sorry, the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been uh, following what's going on at Stony Brook through Liz for a number of years. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Nick, do you want to say anything to introduce yourself while I get the screen sharing going? 
No, all the same. Um, I'm really excited to engage more with y'all, and I, um, I I love this series, and I love being in I love being in conversation with you all. Um, so yeah, let's jump into it. Cool. Um, so we, uh, I, I was especially excited. I'm now at Wesleyan uh, teaching, and I don't have graduate students, unlike Nick and Liz. So I was excited about the idea of coming uh, to the institute, in part to also be uh, to get to know and, and work with um, and be in conversation with Liz's graduate students or the graduate students in the practical class. So we wanted to frame our conversation a little bit to start off with. Um, by kind of some, some about our history and how Nick and I came to work together um, to do this work. Because I know as a graduate student, and even now, I always love hearing about kind of how work comes to be in the world, right? As I, I tell my undergrads, I think graduate students are a little bit more disillusioned of this idea that this work doesn't just happen, right? It happens over so much time and so much kind of collaborative labor, regardless if it's a single issue or single author or publication, or if it's, as Nick and I have been endeavoring to do, more kind of overtly uh, collaborate, collaborative. So Nick and I first met um, back in 2007, actually, this dates us a little bit later. Here's a early shot, Liz is there also. Um, this is at the CSA conference down in San Diego, I think in 2011, but Nick actually dug up when we very first met. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, 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 w I went in the archive and I found the actual conference where we met. It was uh, called Historicism, Homo Normativity, and Queer Political Formations. It was at UC Santa Cruz in May 2007. It featured keynotes by Marcia Ochella, Jasbir Puar, Karen Tonkson, and Lisa Dugan. And uh, many of our, our other colleagues also presented. I remember uh, being very, very impressed at Liz's uh, brilliance and wit. Um, simultaneously uh, in, in, the, in the presentation that she gave. Um, so that was, fun. yeah, so Nick, did you give a talk then also, Nick, or were you? I did, I, I did, I gave, gave a talk on the down low. Oh, literally on, on the down low. Yeah, not, not, on, not, not a down low <laughs> talk, I gave a talk on, on, the, on the subject of the down low. <laughs> Appropriate for the year. Um, so I think we started talking then and just kind of being in similar graduate student circles, um, folks invested in doing kind of leftist thought, feminist thought, queer thought, um, anti-racist thought, um, critical race theory, post-colonial studies, we were kind of just in the mix. Um, but it quickly became apparent to me and I think to Nick that both of us wanted to do work on the university, that we were both taking up the university itself as an object of analysis in ways that, I don't know, I think we even then couldn't find work that actually was doing with the university what we wanted to do with it. Um, so we spent the next, I guess at that point, 10 years um, thinking and working together. Um, we did a reading group, which is really effective to do. If you're not already doing those with your friends and, uh, and kind of fellow students who are writing and thinking about the same areas of thought that you are, strongly encourage it. Um, I learned so much from just reading alongside Nick. Uh, when Rod Ferguson's first book on the university came out, that was one of the things we talked about. We also talked about Moan and Harney and so on, all of which actually then in 2019 or 18 manifested or came to be in the form of a, of a review we wrote together called Critical University Studies and the Crisis Consensus for Feminist Studies. Um, it was supposed to be a short three or four page review, I believe, was what was requested of us. Pretty uh, short, pretty short, relatively short. It didn't end up that way at all. It ended up being like, what, 33 pages? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, th th 30, 31. Mm -hmm. Extensive. It's a piece I'm very, I'm super proud of and that we put into the world. Um, it's, we wrote it before the abolitionist university studies kind of framework started to develop. Um, but it's where we started to kind of think a lot about periodization and kind of interrupting what we saw some of the nostalgia that was so present in critical university studies, which is a field of work that I, I think we still um, both value very much, even as we have um, some critiques of it, right? And want to push it in, in, in different directions, um, particularly because of our training in kind of feminist studies, studies and queer studies and black studies. So a couple of years later, or maybe even just later that year, right after that piece came out, um, we were approached by Eli Meyerhoff and Zach Schwartz Weinstein, um, who are two folks who kind of came up in graduate school alongside this, around the same time with us. Um, Eli was at Minnesota in political science, and Zach was at um, American, uh, sorry, in American Studies at NYU, um, also doing work again, taking the university itself as an object of analysis. Though I think from a more distinctly leftist and labor-based um, angle. I don't know if that's captures what you think as well, Nick, but um, yeah. 
I think it was at actually ASA, the American Studies Association, that they approached me about kind of what would it mean to do work together and to start thinking about this, the university through an abolitionist lens. And then we all started meeting up and talking for the next six months. And it resulted in the publication or the circulation at least of uh, the text called Abolitionist University Studies and Invitation uh, that we released in August, 2019 in advance of an event we held down at Duke uh, with all of these lovely folks. Again, you'll see Liz there. Um, and if, I think that's, you know, Dylan Rodriguez and Isaac um, Kamala, a bunch of really fantastic, brilliant people um, to kind of spend a couple of days together thinking about what might something like abolitionist university studies look like in practice. Much like critical university studies in the crisis consensus, the uh, idea of abolitionist university studies and invitation was to be kind of an invitation document that would uh, circulate and that the people who were coming to the conference would engage with. I think I was the one who proposed that we could do it and it could be like five pages or so. And then it ended up being, you know, 13,000 something words, 30 something pages. As a, yeah, the students in Liz's class who I think read it for today, correct, Liz? Yes. Um, are aware it's, yes, it's not a, it's not a short document. <laughs> I think it does a lot of really important work. And I, I think hopefully providing again a framework for how we can think about the university and think about being in and of the university, um, which I think is, is one of the interventions or one of the, um, I don't know, something that Nick and I were pretty insistent on wanting to think through, recognizing ourselves as certainly in and dependent upon the university and also very much as a product of the universities that we've come through. And so how do we how do we grapple with that? How do we grapple with that, that contradiction for those of us, and I'm guessing many of the people in the space who are deeply critical of the histories and practices and effects of these institutions and yet also organize our lives in many ways, or at least try to, right? And that's if we if we are able to even do so in relationship to them and, and with dependency upon them. And it's a really it's a hard thing to, to kind of figure out how to how to operate within. So we thought we'd maybe give you all a little bit of an overview of some of the primary arguments we're making in the text, but I'm guessing many of those will also come up in the questions that we'll get from the students in just a bit. Do you want to go with this one? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that <laughs> Critical university studies isn't worth doing if it's not abolitionist. And one of the ways of being abolitionist is to really think about how the, the stories that the university tells about itself prop up a certain kind of imagination. And so in order to challenge and think critically about the history of the university, we actually need a different set of time frames. In a lot of ways, we need more time. Um, in order to be able to account for what the university is and where it came from. So many of the more, more nostalgic narratives about the university tend to be the ones that come uh, in the wake of the, the Second World War. Um, and think about the university as an uh, institution key toward social inclusion that enables cl like upward class mobility. Um, and one of the things we, d we try and do is reframe it. Um, so we think about the university not as a post-World War II institution and not one that is defined primarily in, in the context of uh, class mobility, although that, that's certainly an important part of its history, but as an institution that comes in the direct wake uh, of the, so the outbreak of civil war um, and is managing the anxieties that attend the Civil War, specifically the, the, the worry that um, without slavery as a constant presence, uh, economic productivity will fall. Um, the capitalist anxiety about the ability to continually extract without uh, labor coerced under the lash. So the idea that science can um, solve everything is promised by, by universities that organize uh, agricultural and uh, mining uh, arts. And the, the other idea is that in being a post-slavery university, uh, the university becomes more, more intensely involved in settler colonialism in land projects. And this has been um, explored. I think, you know, it's, it's exciting to be doing this work alongside other projects that are uh, unfolding at the same time. So um, I want to shout out um, Christian Natoni and Robert Lee's uh, really important piece, Land Grab Universities, that have uncovered just and documented so extensively the, the, the degree to which um, the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862 relied pivotally on settler colonialism. 
and how universities today continue to rely on the funds and kind of capacities built through that through that history. Um, so we, what we're arguing there then is that where we start the university history, the history of the university matters, right? That if we start the history of UN universities in the US and we are, this project is largely kind of United states -ian, right? And we can think in the Q&A or the discussion more about what, what it means to transnationalize that as a project. But where we started in the US matters. So often it is this post-1944 story that gets told. Um, and again, as Nick was saying, we need to start this certainly by the 1860s. I've been, as Liz knows, I've been spending the last two months in like the 1700s doing, <laughs> doing this work, which is, turns out also very important, shocking. Um, but we're making an argument here that there, there's something unique about the 1860s, right? That the university or the university functions. Um, fortunately, as Nick was saying, there is all this fantastic work. I, I agree, I think land grab universities is perhaps some of the best, but there's a number of texts that have come out over the last 10 years that have made, um, and kind of studies that universities themselves are doing that have made our, it, it possible to think the university, to know the university differently than actually was the case, certainly pre 2000. And I would argue even pre, you know, Ebony and Ivy, uh, Craig Wilder's book, 2013, I think changed the game a lot for kind of how people were thinking about this earlier history of the university. Um, but all of these texts do really important work, though, as we also argue in the piece, um, it doesn't mean they're universally or kind of all abolitionist, right? That many of these are kind of efforts to manage the past, not kind of work towards an abolitionist future, and that there's a real distinction of, uh, between those two things. So what Nick was saying about kind of, oh, yeah, I guess we didn't do the... <laughs> do you want to talk about accumulation? Do you want to take this one? Sure. I, I mean, so one of the frameworks that we tried to reframe, uh, like the way that we talked about the university, is uh, by narrating it through accumulation. And in doing this, we had a lot of inspiration through the, the uh, work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore in Golden Gulag, who uh, tries to find a, a frame that helps her to explain the emergence of the prison system in the early 1980s. And uh, Gilmore's framework really relies on the idea that uh, prison prisons came to be a solution to the overaccumulation of four different surpluses. Surplus is the finance capital, land, labor, and state capacity. And this framework is re re really useful in explaining the mass emergence of certain kinds of infrastructure at a certain moment um, when there, there are these intersecting surpluses. And one of the things that we realize is that actually this framework is applicable, applicable not only to talk about carceral institutions, but to talk about large scale public infrastructure institution building on mass. And so we thought about that, that four surplus framework as applicable to thinking about universities too. Um, in fact, the legislation through which California relied on in order to develop bonds for building prisons um, in the early 80s was actually established through building universities in the 60s. Um, so surpluses of land in places like uh, Orange County, uh, where the Irvine Corporation converted former agricultural land into uh, the first centrally planned um, centrally planned community uh, in the United States uh, and sold uh, acres and acres of land to the University of California for $1. Uh, finance capital, people looking for uh, cheap bonds for investment um, to stabilize other riskier uh, investment practices. Uh, surpluses of labor. Um, universities, if you, if you didn't count uh, all the students uh, or you, if, if you, you thought of students as actually being laborers, uh, you'd have a lot more laborers. Or if you thought of students because they're unwaged as unemployed people, the unemployment rate would, would rise. So uh, university observed, they absorb surplus labor and they absorb state capacity, state's ability to do things, especially uh, in moments of major, um, major willingness to run budget deficits or in the wake of the Second World War in California, uh, state's ability to uh, do things because they have overaccumulated um, budgets. Yeah. So we're thinking then about this, this post-slavery university and kind of the different kinds of accumulation that become possible through it and kind of dependent upon it. So as Nick said before, the Moral Land Ground Act is this kind of primary moment not a primitive accumulation, but of central kind of to the accumulative practices of the university as an institution that holds that holds um, 
material goods, right? And holds kind of the capacities. In kind of updating this um, moment, so we're not, it's not a purely a historical project, right? We're also thinking about kind of what does it mean to think of accumulation um, in the contemporary moment as well and kind of the, the work of the university. So we're, we argue that the university in the now participates in at least four different modes of accumulation, right? Kind of participates in the circulation of, of wealth and of, of value. Um, first of all, through the individualization and accumulation by education, right? I think we all know that we're in, the people in universities are often there to gain accreditation and to kind of, um, to, to bolster the self, right? So the development of human capital, we can think of it as for instance. Um, there's also kind of institutional accumulation when we think about the vast amounts of wealth in, and land held by many universities, right? We often think, and there's this discussion about the kind of corporatization or commercialization of higher education. And yet these institutions for the most part are nonprofits, right? They're technically nonprofits. There is not profit being kind of accruing to the institution, but the institutions are accruing all kinds of debt as Nick was saying through financialization and literally material places. So if you think of what kind of land Stony Brook owns, Seems like it might be a significant little portion of that, uh, that part of Long Island out there is, is held by, by Stony Brook or of NY, certainly of NYU and Columbia is kind of the, the big <laughs> versions of you know, the, the, the always joke of, um, what is it, landholders or, what is that? What's the joke that they, about NYU? I don't work at a university. I work at a real estate development company. That teaches class, <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so there is this kind of accumulation of, of land there as well. Um, I found actually Ruthie Gilmore's uh, interview in the Times a couple of years ago where she talks about how for-profits actually function as parasites on, an, on the nonprofit system, right? The nonprofit system, which itself is not about kind of a, a, um, accumulating profits, but about the circulation of capital. So if you think about how much wealth moves through the university in the form of our paychecks often, um, but also paying places like Aramark and Sodexo and what was the name of the company that makes, has, uses prison labor to make goods that are used on campus? Coracon. Coracon, yeah. These kind of different ways that these institutions are entangled. And then lastly, the university works through kind of the creation of uh, the non-circulation of wages, which as Nick was talking about before is the kind of holding of surplus labor and the imagination of students as not workers, right? That the labor of study, that the labor of learning is not actually labor. The other thing that is kind of central to an abolitionist project, I'm gonna wrap this up quickly because I know we wanna get into the conversation and know our time is running short for our, our portion of this, but that to, to be an abolitionist university is also to always highlight the sites and, and places and kind of organizations of resistance that happen within and adjacent to universities. So we do wanna kind of highlight some of the really important work that's been going on on various campuses. Um, and again, adjacent to campuses, like critical resistance, the BDS movement, uh, this is the divestment movement, uh, the fossil fuel divestment movement up at UMass and then the Hopkins movement against ICE and, and cops on campus. So coming out of this work of writing this paper, um, this invitation and kind of working with Eli and Zach and Nick, we um, decided that we also needed to have something else going on <laughs> and that there's, I don't know, Nick, do you want to talk about cops off campus? Maybe. Sure, I mean, so directly in the wake of, um, in, in, in the wake of the, the mur murder of George Floyd, um, it, intersected in some really important ways uh, with a pretty exciting, if a scary moment of university organizing. I was one of the faculty members who was kind of uh, active in supporting students during the UC Santa Cruz Wildcat strike. And uh, that strike w really had one of the things that they, um, that the, the students engaged in the strike were trying to um, make visible was just the the extent to which the university's investment in police uh, also was a correlated fact of its disinvestment from its students. And so uh, by investing in police, it was able to maintain a social order in which it underpaid or didn't pay um, its students at all. And so uh, the chant became cops off campus, uh, COLA, cost of living adjustment in, in my bank account. And so that, that kind of convergence of circumstances uh, kind of led us to a place where we wanted to help build infrastructure um, that allowed people to study their own own universities in an abolitionist way and collect campus, connect campuses that were doing similar work to each other. So that's the large scale thing that became the Cops Off Campus Research Project. Which we'll probably talk about more later on in the, in the yeah. uh, event today. 
that's the basic overview we wanted to provide. Um, and genuinely, this is an invitation and a kind of frame of thinking that's in process. And so we're really excited to be in conversation with you all today to kind of hear how this may or may not resonate on your campus and in your work. Um, and we're just appreciative to have the space to, to have this conversation. So thanks. Thanks. Should we uh, take it away now with these questions? Go <laughs> okay. for it. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Abigail and Nick, um, for your overview and that present for the invitation itself. Um, so my first question was, I wanted to know, as an academic and as an educator, what are each of your day-to-day -day practices? How do you implement an abolitionist approach in your pedagogy, teaching, and development of your syllabi? How are you engaging in abolitionist research practices? How do you ethically inhabit the university while reconciling being a part of an institution that claims progress but does not meet the standards of the abolitionism of abolitionism? Sorry, so Nick and I get, get to pre. Oh, is that okay? Yeah, uh, Nick and I got to preview this question, um, Yesenia. Th so thank you very much and all the questions. So we were talking the other morning about it and we took it quite literally. <laughs> we were like, what do we do when we wake up and how do we organize our days that actually attempt to make good or, or live up to or whatever to, to, to inhabit this kind of um, way of being in the world. And a lot of it came down to like how we organize our time um, and how that maybe is different from how we sh quote unquote should organize our time um, where for me, doing the work for my students and doing the work of activism often does invade time I should be using to write my book, for instance. Um, and that's a complicated feeling. I, I think as graduate students know, and definitely junior faculty, all faculty, like there's there's the guilt of, of work and of not work and of wrong work <laughs> that is difficult to contend with. Um, so that that is the first thing that came to mind for me. And I think Nick, do you want to speak to that same kind of idea? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think uh, if you, yeah. If you've read Golden Gulag, you know the the chapter on um, the organization Mothers Rec Reclaiming Our Children. And um, one of the things Gilmore says there is that um, in addition and an extension of the Marxist frame, feminist framework of thinking about the double day where um, working class women work outside of the home, um, then they put in an, a second day um, at the home, working in inside the home. Uh, she thinks about the triple day um, that are, you know, uh, that mothers who are engaged in activism do, the third uh, day of labor that involves organizing and um, engaging in activism in order to try and get people free. Um, and so I, I think when we, 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 we talk about activism, it's really worth thinking about in, in a structural sense rather than a kind of the, the classic frame that's that was given to us by a liberal and philanthropy um, in the sense that day to day uh, having these kinds of considerations on, on your mind and trying to uh, think about your time as a structural resource uh, that can be that you utilizes the relative flexibility that academic life offers you to try and route resources uh, differently, try and intervene in the institution as also a, a different kind of context of labor. Um, and so I think that it, it ends up looking in a certain way. I think for many of us who do activism, you won't see us putting out books that quickly, <laughs> um, for instance, just because from day to day, you know, um, I, I counted the other week, I had like God, it was like seven or eight cops off campus meetings between um, Monday and Thursday. And so it, it, it's real um, in terms of, you know, activism structuring the time. Um, Abby, do you, do you want to talk about like more practical day-to-day -day stuff also? Well, I was just thinking in terms of like what activism means also structurally, but mm -hmm. what does it mean to be doing abolitionist based activism? And I think the way that what that both seems to mean, what it means for me, and I think what it means to you um, in, in doing it with you is that it's not just like showing up for meetings, but there's also like a lot of um, like care work, right? And to do I think to do real abolitionist work means I, I actually really like the phrase of kind of prefiguring the world you want to be in and the relationships you make with the people you're organizing with. And that's a different kind of labor. It's a different kind of work. Um, and it means showing up for people. And it means kind of showing up with your full self in a different kind of way than I think some activism and some organizing work um, entails require or requires. Um, 
and then I'll then figure out, yeah, how do you take care of yourself? And not in the cheesy self-care kind of way, but like literally how do you sustain? Because this is a long-term project, right? Abolitionism clearly is a long-term project, but even something like Pops Off Campus, which is a subset of that, um, we have to kind of build for, for endurance. Um, and that's challenging. I think that means something like feeding myself what I want to eat <laughs> and feeding people around me in ways that kind of make me feel good and feel sustainable. Um, it does mean kind of trying to work out and get exercise and feel good in my body in that kind of way when I can. Um, Nick and I were saying, I was saying that's the thing that slips for me. For me, it becomes like student work, activist work, and then that I'm good at eating. The eating part, I'm, I'm generally generally have covered and cooking that I like. Whereas for Nick, I think you have a different kind of bodily relationship to to these practices. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it has to do directly with re responding to some of the bad habits or forms of self-management that I picked up um, trying to survive grad school. Um, and so, you know, being able to, being not able to sustain continuing to drink in the way I did during grad school, and then actually having to quit drinking. Um, and uh, for many people who have had to quit drinking, uh, the, the experience of you finding a new master sort of, um, which means like exercising all the time, uh, not feeling grounded in my in myself unless I exercise kind of like, you know, five plus days a week. Um, and then using that as a, a means of um, gaining momentum into the, the structure of, yeah, every day. But on the point that Abby was bringing up about the importance of not just doing activism to do activism, but to do activism that allows people to access other ways of being in practice that's not only only goal oriented, but that it's important to be able to rep reproduce a glimpse of what that other world can be um, in 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 the context and in the shape and the experience of what you're doing. I think that like one, one of the things that has distinguished and I've really appreciated working with the group of people that we've um, we've been fortunate enough to work with is that uh, there's a strong kind of premium on joy. Um, and I, I just, you know, it's, it's an ethos that I, I found infectious and I found myself wanting to reproduce in different spaces where I'm, I'm working and I think is a pretty uh, central principle to how I think about doing activism in, in the university and beyond. Also, I, I agree. I think that also translates into our teaching as well. Um, like I think teaching should be fun. I think classes should be fun. Um, I tell my students that they're going to hate me sometimes when I make them read things they're not going to want to read, but that I promise them that there'll be like some pleasure in it down the road. Um, and it, again, I think that kind of way of imagining teaching also is a relationship, as a relationship that is about cultivating the self, but cultivating the person, people you're learning and thinking with. Um, like I have at, at Wesleyan, I have smaller classes. There are like 25 this semester, which feels pretty big, but. Um, really trying to get to know my students as much as I can and helping them know each other. Um, whereas Nick teaches giant classes, right, at Santa Cruz. But I think even yeah. you still bring joy into your classroom um, and pleasure yeah. into yeah. it. I try. And also, I mean, I, I do the absurd thing of meeting with all of my students, um, like on a, on a, if not one on one, like I have small group meetings with uh, two to four, four students, even if I have a 300 student class. Um, and so just making sure that they experience a conversation um, <laughs> with me, it, it feels important because I think that sort of relation is easy to get lost in a large classroom. If I'm, is it possible can I turn the conversation, the question back to Senia and see kind of what you were thinking in asking the question and like if there's things that you're doing or things that you're not doing or yeah, what, what brings that to your, to mind for you? Um, I actually really appreciate that you both took it literally or that just like, 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 as I was thinking, I was like, when you wake up and like, whether you get coffee or tea or like, and then even what are your thought processes? Even I know that now um, we're all working from home, but uh, if you are, when you produce this work, it was in 2019. So like walking on the campus, that type of thing, like, what are your thought processes? Um, so I appreciate all of your answers. And for me, I think what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? I Sometimes I feel like I'm constantly in conflict um, uh, I think in some ways I think about even this idea of professionalism, um, or when I'm talking on zoom, sometimes I'm always 
constantly like this anxious feeling of like, I'm going to talk a certain way, like I'm talking to my friends and that's how I want to speak. But I, I wanted to feel genuine. I want to be present in this moment by being my genuine self. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I think that is in itself, like this small piece of abolitionist work, even, even just on a small connection based level. Um, and so in some ways, I think during my journey of getting into grad school and thinking, how am I going to branch out with my own personal work? I want to bring that same small element that I find in this space and bringing it outside into my other work. Um, when it comes to, I know later on, I'm going to ask another question, which I know you both reviewed. Um, but in terms of my own research, I think about like, how can we bring this idea of home into a space where people don't have a home? Um, and I think that's the true abolitionist work that I have to figure out and get to that point. But yeah, just a little thing. Awesome, thank you. All right, is that, can I, can we move forward or are we good? Okay, perfect. Um, all right, also I echo uh, Jacenia, thank you for a wonderful overview and I'm really excited about this event. I uh, had been thinking of the ways that uh, universities deploy and co-opt the language of resistance movements. Like uh, I read Jennifer C. Nash's, um, what is it, after intersectionality or beyond mm-hmm. intersectionality, something like that. And um, about how intersectionality was co-opted by uh, the university. Do you think there's a similar risk here with the language of abolition? In what ways do you already see this happening from both universities at large and in the work of individual scholars? How can we push back against this? And what effect, if any, does this have in the way you conceptualized this project? Nick, do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. It's it's a great one. It's one I think about uh, a lot. Um, and if you like, I, I feel like th- this is the point. If you have little ones around, you may want to may want to uh, cover their ears because I I, I think I, I regularly had a. Uh, comment when we were um, discussing writing the invitation um, with uh, Eli and Zach, which was that when you're working in a university and you're successful with some of the the frameworks you produce, uh, as Eddie Murphy said in in Delirious, a a very important and problematic um, stand-up special, um, people are going to fuck up your jokes. Um, and that, what, what that means is that they're going to, yes, they're, they're going to reproduce uh, what they see, what they're reading as in the framework in ways that you did not anticipate, um, that you did not intend, um, that are going to alarm you, um, and maybe uh, even terrify you. Um, I think in some ways, and Shout, shouts to Jen Nash, who was actually the person who commissioned us to write the crisis consensus uh, piece for 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 fe- feminist studies. Um, but I, I think the first thing I think about is we're not necessarily trying not to get misappropriated. <laughs> um, like I, I, I think misappropriation is the one of the ways that ideas live and it's one of the legitimate ways that ideas live and so i think trying to stay engaged in the life of the, of the ideas is one way but i i don't know if i necessarily imagine that there, there's a way of of building a framework having that framework live a life and not um having it first of all not having it disappoint you and that's that's one of the things that i i i've learned from reading uh robin wiegman um many times but like the framework will disappoint you um and also having it be appropriated by powers that you never quite expected it to and that has to do with the fact that like we are part of the university um the university, like we're, we're, we're part of the university that is going to appropriate uh, the, the, the language it, itself. And so uh, Bakhtin famously said that the word is uh, always half in someone else's mouth. Um, and you never know part of the, 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 the production of ideas is that ideas never entirely belong to you when they're attributed to your name. Um, And that's a wonderful thing. And that's also a a, a terrifying thing. And so um, 
attending to that is part of what, what's, what's interesting of, see, of seeing, um, having a piece out in the world. I mean, in abolition, I agree with everything Nick just said, but also, I mean, abolition is a kind of particular formulation, right? In that it, it has such a, a specific history that is clearly loaded and full of power and needs to be attended to. Um, and so I, I, I definitely think that there's gonna be, there's an appropriation of abolitionism. I, we were surprised when, you know, Duke wanted to host our conference on abolitionist university studies or when the same semester UIUC was having an abolitionist kind of uh, project run th throughout the entire year. And yet, as we know, if when you see it kind of popping up and being kind of taken into these different organizations, these different institutions, something is afoot with kind of the um, capacity of these institutions to incorporate and exploit these, these ideas. I think we're deciding to stay with the conversation, right? To stay with abolitionism and to insist on kind of a politic and a history um, for when that term is taken up by, by various places. Um, so I don't wanna, I wanna move on to the next question because I know our time is running short, but I think that there's something to kind of really insisting on the historicity of the, of the, con of the concept um, as it gets deployed and redeployed now. Yeah, and that the, the combination of, of vigilance and also willingness to to see see how it stretches, mm -hmm. um, see 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 how how frameworks stretch. Um, I th I think you know some people might object to our our use of the uh, the four surpluses accumulation framework in in thinking about universities and and prisons. One of the anxieties we try and attend to. Uh, so both the the importance of trying to extend the frameworks and maintaining a degree of critical vigilance about what is politically important to keep attaching to abolition. Um, for me, that has that means it needs to have a dynamic relationship to bl Black freedom movement. Um, it has to have a dynamic and meaningful relationship to the critique of settler colonialism and to native futures. Um, which are not the same thing. Um, and I, I think that it needs to carry forward the critique of um, the gendered and racial structures of capitalism at minimum. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask you about the international students because I am an international student here in uh, Stony Brook University. Uh, so I told at least two things while I'm reading your, your text. And um, one is how this proposal, this uh, invitation to abolish the university can become transnational. And if you, how do you think that? How will be in other academy, not, not only US academy? And the other is that as an international student, for me, it's a great opportunity being here in this university studying. And I think it's maybe the only opportunity that I have to uh, get a PhD. So uh, thinking in that, uh, what, do you, what do you think about that uh, related to the abolish university? So what happened with international students if university is abolished? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important, thank you for the question, Mario. Um, and I, for me, this part of why I've been spent the last 15 years researching <laughs> of non-citizen students, international students, is that there, I think there's something really crucial in how we understand the university in the U.S. Um, to understand the U U.S. university is always constituted actually as a transnational entity, right? That when we think about this long history of the U.S. university going back well before 1860, actually, right? Well, well before the post-slavery university, these universities were founded uh, and funded through efforts to um, you know, if you think of Harvard's founding or of William and Mary, the first two institutions in the US, their, their charters were to educate quote unquote heathens, right? It was a kind of British colonial project of educating heathens. That's how land was given. So how land was acquired or accumulated by the institutions. It's how their charters were based. It's how they got money. So these institutions have always been predicated upon kind of an, um, an incorporative logic of bringing quote unquote others or heathens in, in the kind of pre-1860s moment into the institution and then propagating the ideas um, of white Christianity um, out, outwards from them. So I think when we think of the university as kind of constitutionally transnational, right? Tr constitutionally about the kind of spreading of ideas beyond, that are kind of held by the people who run the universities out into the world, that tells us something. 
But then as you also point out, there's something about what is the opportunity of the university also, right? These are still spaces of desire, um, which gets, I think, part of why we're or spaces that are desired and desired for good reason, right? There are unique, there's a unique conglomeration or kind of coming together of resources and spaces for learning and thinking and studying that happens at these institutions that would not otherwise be available. And so how do you handle the kind of contradiction of abolition as not the kind of destruction of universities, right? Um, necessarily the radical transformation, but as a claiming of the resources that are made available here, as a claiming and kind of rep repurposing, or as, as Liz has said, quoting the, the, the piece, kind of exploiting the possibilities of these institutions in ways that maybe they're not necessarily intended to, in ways they're not necessarily intended to operate. And so I, mean, I was talking to my students and I'm teaching abolitionist university studies class at uh, Wesleyan right now. And really they come in, they wanna critique the university and tear it down, which I'm all for in many ways, but then thinking about what once if we were to abolish the university, what would we want to retain? Like what how do we kind of what kind of spaces or opportunities or possibilities are unique uniquely available in the university? And how do we kind of handle our relationship to those? What, what do we do with those in this kind of moment of abolition? And I think that there's something about kind of transnational movement of people and ideas that are uh, that's operationalized and made possible through the university that we actually don't want to let go of. Right. Nick, do you have do you have thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, and I, I think it's okay. It's okay to want it all, <laughs> for, first of all, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why in the piece we, we talk about having an abolitionist relationship to the uni university in the first instance, uh, which I would not say is the the exact same thing that people would think when we when you say abolish the the university because I part of part of part of it. It's just, I think it's more honest. We're in universities, we're here for a reason. We're, we're still here uh, for, for various reasons. Um, and so, and we think there are parts of being here that are important and useful um, and we can make things here. Um, and so I, I definitely agree with Abby just in terms of the the, the framework um, and I think that we need to build movements that also articulate and imagine transnationally um, on different terms um, and I think that's a necessary part of of actually doing um, abolitionist work the university is already transnational um, in their various ways and I think if the Part of the problem is that some of the worst parts of the university are are, are, are transnational, um, but also some of the ways of fighting those worst parts ha are going to use the transnational character of the university um, as a resource um, toward other toward other ends. Okay, thank you very much. Did you have did you have thoughts that you were thinking or things you were thinking about in terms of the kind of implications for thinking abolitionist university and transnationally? Yes, I, I have some. Uh, I, I was thinking at the beginning in my country, in, uh, here in Colombia, um, universities seem, I think, in the United States as well. No, but here's like, uh, if you don't go to the university, you you can't uh, uh, be, uh, you, you can move your class, no? It's like, uh, it's, it's, it's a tool to be, uh, it, it's, and it's not only an economic thing, it's a, a, a class matter. It's like, mm -hmm. if you study, so you are a better person, no? So, and here in Colombia, it's very, it's very expensive, the university, so, it's not only it's not only a matter of uh, symbolic knowledge. It's a matter of uh, material accessibility to the university. So uh, I was thinking is I was thinking that the university a lot of times is seen like a company, like an enterprise. When you get there, so you will be a part of this. Uh, much better group of persons. So I was thinking about that. And I think a lot of times, most of my, uh, uh, of my most of the, the people from Colombia, uh, I think, 
would like to go to the United States to study just because that's another step to uh, go higher on the social class. And yet it, seemed, it sounded like you also found something else happening for yourself at the university. Is it, is it, is that accurate or is it solely kind of a um, upper mobility kind of movement for you? No, I, I think it's a, so abolition university, it's a, a I think as a possibility to uh, question the, the foundations of the educational system. So I think it's important to transnationalize the, the movement, the invitation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so for the next question, um, with regard to uh, the Cops Off Campus Project and the Abolitionist University invitation, I was thinking about uh, various institutions that claim an identity of progression when the underbelly of such progression is in fact policing the populations they want to help. Uh, in my own research, I'm concerned with the removal of oppressive shelter practices based on my time as a caseworker. Uh, despite my previous organization's helping model of long-term self-sufficiency to assist clients with shelter, locating housing, and maintaining permanent housing as caseworkers and housing specialists, we were actually policing these individuals' lives into complying with society's capitalist hegemony. We enforced a punitive system when clients did not comply, which caused them harm and stunted their mobility to obtain and maintain permanent housing. When looking towards a college campus environment, uh, we see a similar claim of progression, especially in regards to sexual assault with laws like Title IX and the Clery Act, along with other procedures and policies. However, colleges and universities continuously police victims and do not supply statistics on sexual assault that could produce possibilities of prevention and efficient practices of resolve. How can the Cops Off Campus project project provide the possibility of a future with alternative modes of justice in response to sexual assault? Can this approach include a queer and feminist outlook? How can alternative modes of justice be utilized outside of the U.S. higher education system or even more broadly within uh, communities? Real quick, you, I'm sure you've read Craig Wolsey's um, The Value of Homelessness, and if not, I think you would find it really, I will. really helpful. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Um, and then, Nick, do you want to talk about Care Not Cops? It seems like a well, I mean, I, I, I can say a couple things about, especially university budgets, um, when, when it comes to um, housing uh, projects, especially. Um, and I'll start here. So I work for the University of California. University of California um, spends $150 uh, million of permanent budget on policing, and it uh, spends millions more on its discretionary budget. Um, Part of what that $150 million goes to is policing a general, um, allowing a police force that does not have to respect the borders that most other police forces are confined to, to be mo uh, effective mobile army, army throughout the state. Um, policing different campuses. So if, if there's a protest at UC Santa Cruz, you'll have cops uh, driving up from Santa Barbara, driving down from Davis, driving down from um, um, Berkeley. Um, those $150 million are resources that are being extracted primarily from the increasing number of working class um, and poor students who uh, inhabit the university in the form of tuition. And it's made available largely through state um, financial aid and uh, federal student loan programs that allow the many um, real estate um, parties in Santa Cruz to uh, effectively be able to utilize um, the increasing number of students the university is being asked to serve uh, as a way of constantly uh, increasing rent because student loans will all, always be available through, through the federal um, government. Uh, the, the, the availability of the student loan funds uh, allows uh, landlords to just inflate um, at will as long as there's enough uh, housing demand. Um, and so I think that like when, when we're thinking about this intersection of things, uh, universities 
pol policing and um, housing actually have a lot of really, um, it names a, a, a constellation of, of intersecting um, problems. And there are, when you see that $140 million, I, I don't want to just say if we abolish cops, we'd have $140 million more dollars because the problem is that the, that $140 million is already being extracted from students. Um, we need state, uh, like an a entirely different campaign so that that money is not actually being extracted in, from students in the form of tuition. And to think about um, abolishing cops as a way of reinvesting the uh, the resources that actually allow different kinds of visions of justice to be enacted. Um, but the problem is that, you know, we don't have a, an account of how much money universities spend on policing. Um, and we can only kind of begin to grasp the notion. So part of the, the, the impulse behind those projects is to be able to think about the different kinds of stories and possibilities that we can tell if we know the extent to and the effects of uh, university investments of policing so that the, that money is not just money that we reinvest, but we think about why, we, why it was invested in policing in the first place. Um, and part of that has to do with making certain conversations about justice um, impossible. Um, and so I don't know if I have a, lo a lot of very pointed things to say about what particular shape justice takes as much as I, I, I think that part of the Cops Off Campus conversation is about trying to really sh um, make a different kind of uh, conversation about justice possible by really attending carefully to universities as um, extractive institutions um, in all of their practices. For the sake of time, I might see if there are there, are there how many more questions are there that you all want to ask? I was actually going to jump in and say, uh, A, I want to be mindful of the time, and I think the event was scheduled to end at four, but I also know we had a bit of a late start. Uh, so I was thinking, Adrian, is it okay if we lingered a little bit longer and folks who can stay on could stay on? Um, I was wondering, uh, I think it's Mario and Johnny have the last uh, question. If we wanna hold off on that, cause that might be an interesting way to go out. Um, and we could let folks uh, jump in with questions. You can drop them into the chat. You can raise your virtual hand. You can just wave at us. Um, but there is a question in the chat that I thought um, we could jump to. I don't know if Nick and Abby saw it, but uh, it's, it's from Francesca, who's also in the graduate teaching practicum. They write, does abolition seek to pay undergrad students for their intellectual labor to rectify this non-circulation of wages and to make education accessible to more people who need to work multiple part-time jobs to survive and care for family, et cetera? How might this be achieved and what's the risk? Is there a further commodification of human capital, the corporatization of learning? Um, so tackle that and then folks can drop other things in or jump in. I mean, I think at the, on the basic level, I think learning and studying is labor, and so it should be paid for, <laughs> and people should have the capacity to to do that. And so I think yes, to to me and Nick might differ on this, but um, yes, undergraduate labor students should be compensated for the labor that is their learning, that is their time, um, that kind of the removal of that of that kind of or the impossibility what feels like the impossibility of that as a as a um, as a reality. I think is a thing to, to imagine beyond, right? To, to imagine towards a place where our intellectual labor of being in, in conversation together um, is work, is a work that is compensated and that is made possible as a way of living. Nick, what do you, what do you think on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I support student organizing uh, for toward the to, toward answers for these questions. I think that that's my my, fir my first answer, partly because I I, I think that. I support wages for students, absolutely. Um, I, I don't know if students want to become workers. Um, and I think that the, I, I would want to hold those two things as actually two different questions because uh, I, I think that one of the, and part of this is what I heard in, in, in Mario's question, um, which is that it's nice that 
universities for many, not all people who work in them, but for many people who work in them can be institutions where there, where time gets freed. Um, where time can live relatively free from having to produce market output. And I think that that freedom is one that we need and that the category of the student allows for the possibility for in a way that the category of the worker may not. <laughs> and so I, I so I support wages for students. Um, I, I don't know if I think I want to think of students as workers in the same way as much as to try and embrace um, the other possibilities that can attach themselves to the category of the student without also accepting the correlated mm -hmm. wagelessness that is part of what we've historically attached to it. Um, and so I think that this is what our, 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 our comrade Eli Meyerhoff like would think about as like embracing the possibility for study um, and study as a, as a way of existing otherwise. And Catherine, thank you for po pointing that out. I think that the, um, yes. you know, in counter planning from the kitchen, um, Federici, and I think uh, th that's one of the, one of my favorite Federici and um, uh, Catherine Cox pieces, like the, the, um, the idea of part of wages for housework is about demanding for wages for housework. The other part is the political perspective that emerges from the idea there, there uh, that gets articulated there. And that insisting on the abstraction of the, the, the position of, uh, of wages for housework is really important. And I think that the, the idea of wages for students, and we are not the first people to talk about wages for students. This is a, a, long, uh, a long set of campaigns. Um, and you'll, you'll find the, the original plant pamphlet on the Zero Work website. Um, but yeah, wages for, for students can be, is, is a really important political perspective, I think, as well. There's another question in the chat um, about adjunctification. Um, and specifically, do you see, this is from uh, Julia, uh, another, another student from our class. Do you see the adjunctification of the university's labor force lending to the protection of current institutional practices? In other words, what are your views on the abolitionist framework and adjunct labor? I think you've written about this history. So if you wanna speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that In many ways, the, the, the adjunctification of the university's labor force is a logical part of the institutional history. The, the weird thing to account for is tenure. Um, why, why, why tenure existed um, in, in, in the first place? Because um, the, once the university started becoming a more mass institution, um, the 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 effort to suppress wages as much as possible um, and to move away from the the kind of Fordist lifetime framework seemed largely prescript prescripted in the, the capitalist life of of the institution from the start um, corporate entities wanted more and more control and tenure was largely a response to an attempt to establish university uh, university professorial labor on this weird amalgamation of like uh, uh, the metaphor of university professors are like Supreme Court justices that you see in John Dewey's writings where he's trying to say, uh, yeah, we need to try and, you know, protect uh, university labor on on that model, and then the Fordist idea of kind of um, lifetime, relatively well well waged um, work as well. And so I, I think that I think that I see the, the adjunctification of the labor force as part of the overall 
uh, logic of the institution, but how it happened <laughs> is, I think, the big story that needs to be told. And I, I um, one of the things that I try and emphasize when I'm telling that story is that it's not only top down. Um, if you look at how people lived in the 60s, um, so in San Francisco, one could live and pay rent on part-time job uh, in San Francisco in 1968. Um, and so the idea of taking on a class so that you could work part-time for a university and the idea of doing that was actually exciting for a lot of activists in the, in, in the moment. And the idea that you could be part of a university's teaching force without building a career in the university is part of what I've called like adjunctification from below because the idea was that this was a, a site through which communities could build their own relationships to universities and not have the tenure stream academics, which they saw as a white supremacist kind of formation, uh, dictate the entire shape of the of the institution. Uh, a lot of those ideas had to do with other ways of seeing the university in the production of free time, like I, I, I was talking about. And so I, I would say like the overall um, trending of the institution toward higher tuition extraction has to do with a reaction to the 60s. Tuition inflation has to do with the reaction to, to, to the 60s. But I, I, would, I would try and think about adjunctification and casualization a little bit differently. Um, just because casualization is about getting rid of full-time jobs and creating uh, precarious, uh, unbenefited uh, institutions. Whereas adjunctification can also mean trying to pull away resources toward different pools of, of legitimacy um, and community organizational efforts. Uh, Shani, if you're there, and Mario, do you want to kind of open up that maybe final question? So Shani, you're, 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 you're moving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I, I uh, thank you for not letting me get too far. Uh, so Mario and I both wrote this question, and I'm just going to read it. Uh, during the pandemic, universities experienced a change in their ways of teaching. Remote teaching brings with it the possibilities of universities without physical spaces. How does this experience modify your invitation to abolish the university? It seems that remote learning is seen as, as, is seen as more efficient in economic terms because it does not require physical spaces, building maintenance with the same volume of faculty. How can the abolition of the university cope with this new situation? What kind of university futures can be assumed from this current transformation in the way of educating? How can the invitation to, the, to abolish the university help or not to build those futures? And how can the university's abolition become a deviant or queer proposal of the future that faces this pandemic present? I mean, Nick and I talked about this. Thank you for the question. Uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, I think, when we were first um, talking over the questions. And I think it, it's going to vary from institution to institution. And one thing that makes it, I think, is difficult about study in higher education in the US is that there is no single form, right? So I think at Wesleyan, our, the president here used to be a bit, like he loved, loved, loved some MOOCs in the early 2010s, like wrote a book that was partly about his love for MOOCs. Um, I don't think he has that same faith anymore, right? I mean, A, MOOCs died, which or at least significantly kind of, uh, you know, diminished. Um, it, places like Wesleyan, I think, recognize now that online education is not going to be our future. It, it can't be. Like these small liberal arts colleges kind of feed off of the kind of um, the, the people living together and being in the same place and having class in person. Um, whereas I think Nick's kind of experience and thoughts on that are really different. Oh, thank you, Nick. Um, in terms of what's happening at Santa Cruz or within the UCs and kind of how this might, this is a future to be built on in many ways or to be um, taken further. Um, 
Yeah, do you want to speak on that, Nick? I am so conflicted about this. Um, what, what, what I will say, I had conversations years ago about pe with people like, you know, I don't don't give capitalism teleportation. Don't give it to like, don't give it to them. Like you are going to regret it because it like is going to allow even more extraction once people can do their work across spaces. It, it increases the labor pool, the available labor pool, and therefore it's going to have this just uh, downward gravitational effect on on wages. So um, I, I think that if any time, it's it's a good time for organizing. <laughs> um, and I, I don't think remote teaching is I don't think it's the absolute worst thing if done in an organized fashion. Um, but I think that dictating the terms as much as possible uh, requires a level of organization that um, I, I think much of our t tenure stream professory, especially these days, is is categorically incapable of of um, moving toward because of the the, um, the institutional liberalism that is their um, default ideology, um, and so I, I I think having those conversations is likely not to happen, and there there are a lot of people just trying to like waiting for the moment we return to brick and mortar um, as, as the necessary moment. But I see this as one question as intersecting, that's intersecting with a whole bunch of other problems and needs to be framed and in conversation with movements. Um, about the way that we do education, about what it means to do education. There's a lot more up for grabs, I think, than we necessarily are appreciating. And this is why, like, um, when we've been doing our Cops Off Campus work, we've been trying to absolutely differentiate it from austerity work. Um, if we just treat cops like a, a thing that you want, you need to strike from the budget, then the austerity hawks win. Um, and so we, we talk about cops off campus as one in one um, particular issue in a plank toward tuition free education, um, toward universal health care, and that thing is thinking about reshaping social safety nets, uh, about work, worker power, uh, about actual housing, like, um, yeah, universal housing um, for everyone. <laughs> and so uh, in, in thinking about the, the kind of infrastructure that we need to build for universities, we need to be able to have a social vision in mind. Um, and that means thinking well beyond universities. People who are at university administrations already do this. It's just that their vision is monopolizing our future in a lot of ways that we haven't, that we don't see until it's taken shape. And so um, the comprehensive social vision has to, like, I think it's it's pretty basic, but it has to go beyond the university. Um, <laughs> that you, like the university can be part of a different, articulating a different imagination about what it means to be in a society and in relation to each other. And in some ways, the pandemic and Cops Off Campus are both organized in relation to, about the relationship of the university to the spaces around the university, right? You can't think about the pandemic and bringing students back to a campus where there's questions of contagion that th there are no walls around the university, right? In terms of how, how, how COVID can travel. And similarly, as we're seeing the research we're doing on Cops Off Campus, the cops, they aren't the wall, right? They're the things that actually move across the, the wall and bring the power of the university to bear so often on the communities that surround them. And so I think in terms of thinking about relationality, there's a way of recognizing the university is certainly not an ivory tower, but very much kind of part of uh, you know, an ecology that we need to attend to. So I'm, I'm hoping that one direction, I think I see some of the national cops off campus organizing going in is doing more collective organizing with communities that are adjacent to and often kind of part of the, the university or, or kind of the university is part of that community in ways that is rarely actually thought about. Well, I think in the interest of time, we should probably wrap up here. Uh, 
Thank you, Abby and Nick. Well, also thank you to Jasenia, who had to drop out to run to class, to Mario and to Genevieve for shepherding us through the Q&A. Thanks to all of you for coming. And then of course, thanks to Abby and Nick for kind of talking through some of your ideas. And uh, I, as always, appreciate the humility of uh, you saying when you don't know, saying when you're not sure, pointing to where the organizing work has to happen um, and just leaving us frankly with a whole lot more questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all so much Bye. for having us. <laughs> thank you for organizing.